We need to be aware of this. Anxiety is commonly linked with autism. Can you explain a little bit about the specific manner anxiety impacts upon autistic people and what, how this might differ from non-autistic people? That's a really interesting one. I'm not 100% convinced that as an emotional state, autism or autistic children, adults experience anxiety per se in a different way. But the big difference, so in a sense, I don't think there's such thing as autistic anxiety. Yeah. It's not the realm of just autistic people. Other people can be anxious <laughs> as well. But for me, um, in terms of what people report to me and what I see on a often a day-to-day -day basis, is that the duration of anxiety um, around specific events and the intensity of that anxiety can be qualitatively massively massively different for the autistic child and of course what what uh, lends itself to that anxiety can be very different as well so what might not cause any anxiety at all for a predominant neurotype child or adult might be massively massively stressful for the autistic person and it has to be said vice versa so just going back and, and the third thing to say because i like things in threes um is the uh, the ongoing like literally ongoing state of anxiety that some autistic people find themselves in and for me that's almost the most dangerous because it's the most invisible as well so we know um sometimes people we, we're quite obsessed aren't we with triggers oh that triggered that child's anxiety let's this child is having a meltdown or shutdown or, or whatever let's find out the trigger for me the trigger is the very last point that tipped the kid over the edge um occasionally there are triggers that are literally just triggers but very often it's a whole stuff the, the whole realm of stuff that's gone on before and it was the tipping point i always i always think it uh, akin to it to drinking when you you meet up with your mate he's like oh i was so sick last night uh it was that last whiskey and you think well what about the 10 pints of guinness yeah. you had before you know did that not have anything to do with it as well um so i think going back to the um the intensity and duration situation i think some children will feel anxious about an upcoming event sometimes weeks sometimes months in advance um there'll be an intensity in terms of that anxiety peaking um during that event and that event can be something as an innocuous as a child's party or something along those lines and then what i sometimes refer to which is the lovely autistic led saying the the social hangover or the anxiety hangover where the child then continues feeling anxious sometimes for weeks sometimes longer afterwards ruminating on everything it's like where did i go wrong what could i have done right all of those sorts of things just quickly going back to the low level there's more and more stuff in fact years at a time and i think that anxiety stems from just living in a PNT world without adjustments being made. So going back to, I keep banging on and on and on about it, poor you and your poor listeners, but autism plus environment equals outcome. So if the environment isn't right, very often that outcome leads to anxiety. So unless we're getting the environment right, we are potentially subjecting our children to lifelong complex um, mental health problems. And that's, that's what really concerns me. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose I always come back to that kind of Maslow's hierarchy of need and looking at those physiological uh, foundations and then moving on to safety. And if somebody doesn't feel safe in their environment, ultimately, they're not going to be able to, 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 to realise their potential, I suppose. Do you know? Um, so I, lo I, I, I always come back to the, the golden equation when I teach, no matter what I do, the golden equation is, is part of all classes and stuff because it's so, so, so important that people realise. But I do, I do think too that, um, that, that it's that pervasive level of anxiety that sometimes people fail to, to, to note, I suppose, or to, to acknowledge as the foundation for any trigger to follow. You're so right, Sharon. And I think one of the problems is, um, autistic people themselves don't necessarily know so if you live in a constant state of anxiety how do you know that it's any different for anybody else yeah um and so how do you know whether you should be doing anything about it and it's tragic when you talk to an autistic person and and they finally talk about feeling like that all the time and then you sort of go well you know surely there's something we can do about this and they say is there is there really i just assumed everybody was like that yeah. like no no it isn't most yeah. people are not in this constant state of anxiety um and i think that's where uh, parents professionals everybody really needs to be extraordinarily proactive to seek out 
um, and to identify whether or not the child or the adult is actually in an anxious state. Yeah. Because as I say, the child themselves might not necessarily know it in that overt manner. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is quite a recent article, a research from Kieran Rose and Dr. Amy Pearson, who find widespread abuse of autistic people. The University of Sunderland called it bleak, yet incredibly important research. It was fundamentally important for me, along with Dr. Pearson, to bring to light the many ways autistic people are abused, wittingly or unwittingly, by the people who should be supporting us, caring for us and advocating for us. The people often closest to us, emotionally and physically, in whom we should be able to trust. As autistic people ourselves, it wasn't easy research to conduct. Whilst there is a trigger warning if you read the report and the research, because truly it is bleak, I'm also hearing that autistic people are finding it incredibly validating. As Amy and I state in the report, we need a new narrative that highlights the trauma autistic people experience through victimization, but which also shines a spotlight on the role of perpetrators, rather than what the victims should be doing to change. We truly hope that victims of abuse will see themselves as just that, victims. They weren't at fault. They weren't to blame. The paper is subtitled. I felt like I deserved it because I was autistic. And we sincerely hope that from reading the research, autistic people will realize that they did not deserve it and they were indeed victims. If you would like to read more about the research, you can do that here. New report finds widespread abuse of autistic people. If you would like to read the report generated by the research, you can do that here. IPV report. If you would like to read the research in full, you can do that here. Professionals are the hardest to trust. Supporting autistic adults who have experienced interpersonal victimization. Please do share the research so that we can ensure the vital and necessary changes are made to stop this abuse. So this is the study. New report finds widespread abuse of autistic people by University of Sunderland. The abuse that autistic people have experienced at the hands of someone they know and the difficulties they face in trying to access support have been unveiled in a new study. The findings suggest many frontline professionals are not adequately trained in working with autistic people who have suffered some form of victimization or abuse, whether it's family, friends, colleagues or professionals, resulting in poor mental health. Psychology researchers at the University of Sunderland carried out the study, the first of its kind in England, exploring more than 100 autistic adults' experiences of interpersonal violence and victimization, violence and abuse, emotional, physical, sexual and financial exploitation, within personal relationships focusing on how it impacts on their identity and their experiences of seeking help and support. One factor explaining the high prevalence of interpersonal violence and victimization among autistic people is stigma. Autistic people are stigmatized at both a group level due to negative perception of autism 
and at the individual level for failing to meet so-called normal expectations. The report's key findings found that victimization was viewed as a normal part of life and had come to be expected. Autistic people were treated as other throughout their lives regardless of whether they were formally diagnosed as autistic. Yeah. So, I always knew I was different just because already at school I was labeled as a dreamer or not taking part in the classes because I was shy. I was labeled as shy and um, I had selective mutism when the teacher called me out. So I was just mute. I couldn't answer the question. Like deer in the headlights, frozen. And then the teachers always reported that I did not socialize with the other kids as I should have like anybody else. So that caused anxiety in me because I was labeled as different already, never knowing I was autistic until the age of 46. But there were always struggles, always difficulty, coupled with anxiety, because I could not perform the way they wanted me to perform. The trauma of victimization led to the development of masking, feeling the need to suppress or hide aspects of their identity within relationships, which often led to exhaustion and burnout. The majority of the participants first experienced IPV in childhood. The most common perpetrators were friends or family members, followed by colleagues and partners. Dr. Amy Pearson, senior lecturer in psychology, and the research team interviewed 102 autistic adults aged 19 to 73 and asked them questions about their experiences of victimization, including how it made them feel, how it affected their relationships, whether they had sought support, the barriers and facilitators to recovery that they faced, and recommendations for improving services. Autistic people experience IPV at an alarming rate, including repeated instances, says Dr. Pearson, which then leads to complex post-traumatic stress injury. It's very bleak and we've just lifted the lid. More research needs to be done at a national level. It's essential that we understand the impact of IPV within the autistic population and how to support autistic adults who have been victimized by familiar others. Other findings highlighted that support is scarce and the limited support available is fraught with structural barriers, including the lack of understanding from professionals. Dr. Pearson says, the study highlighted the difficulties many autistic people face in trying to access support after experiencing victimization. They suggest that many frontline professionals, from police to therapists, are not adequately trained in working with autistic people. In order to make sense of their experiences, it was important that autistic people had access to the right language and concepts to put names to what had happened to them. We asked respondents what their ideal form of support would look like and what kind of changes they might like to see. 
Many people found it difficult to imagine a world where good support was easily accessible due to the presence of structural inequality and said that we need to rethink how we consider and treat neurodivergent and disabled people. The study also found that compassionate and supportive relationships were instrumental in recovery. Participants outlined the importance of autistic spaces, which included community groups or spaces run by autistic professionals. They emphasized how such spaces reduced a need for masking and provided somewhere where they felt free from judgment. We found four key themes in our analysis. One, the usual for autism. Victimization was viewed as a normal part of life and had come to be expected. Autistic people were treated as other throughout their lives regardless of whether they were formally identified, diagnosed autistic or not. 2. Personhood revoked, the cost of living. The trauma of victimization led to the development of identity management and concealment masking. Engaging in identity management was exhausting and led to burnout. 3. Unpacking the baggage. In order to make sense of their experiences, it was important that autistic people had access to the right language and concepts to put names to what had happened to them. 4. If you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you have to invent the universe first. The experience of seeking support was impacted by structural inequality and power dynamics with professionals. Compassionate and supportive relationships were instrumental in recovery. Seeking support. We ask people whether they had received support after experiencing victimization. Over half of the respondents had received support from a peer, e.g. a friend, or their partner, or professional, e.g. the police, a therapist, but 40% said that they had not. Barriers. For those people who reported having no sought support, there were several common reasons given. These centered on the normalization of abusive relationships, e.g. thinking that what they were experiencing was just how things were, not being aware that support services might be available to them, e.g. not knowing who to ask, or being too ashamed or scared to seek help. For people who had sought and received support, their experiences with professionals were mixed. Some respondents reported Negative experiences with the police such as being forced to make eye contact or a lack of eye contact being interpreted as dishonesty, which highlights the need for ensuring that frontline workers receive good quality up-to-date training on autism and neurodiversity more broadly. Problem is if someone is not diagnosed. Anyway, uh, the police... They amazingly believe my body language says I am lying and proceed to caution me or threaten me about being arrested myself. The police laughed at me, forced me to look into their eyes, something that is very upsetting for me, and they even yelled at me. Great. Others struggled to build a relationship with a therapist or found it difficult to trust them due to previous negative experiences. Yeah, some therapists can be so patronizing. <laughs> or just 
wanting to push their modality onto you and then you end up gaslighting yourself if you would use that so one example i was in a waiting room for cranial sacral therapy it can be helpful if you are okay being touched and then one person came in having this horrendous perfume or aftershave i'm not sure it was just horrible and making weird noises all the time so i could tolerate the noises but the perfume i felt nauseous it was just so bad and it was just five minutes before my turn for my appointment and then therefore i was in conflict with myself should i go outside it's just five minutes but the stench is horrible what shall i do and i got more and more stressed from everything oh and then well i didn't go outside and um, i told the autism friendly therapist um what had happened and and she was very kind and she said well if this ever happens again you go outside you listen to what you experience and then you can just call from the window or write a note that you are waiting outside so she absolutely validated my experience and i felt nauseous like for an hour i couldn't enjoy the session because i was sick to my stomach from that stench five minutes being exposed to this horrible perfume yeah so i felt so glad for the validation it felt so good to me so i told this experience to a psychiatrist to whom I went because of the cold um, trauma and he was a behavioral psychologist specialized on trauma I told him that experience for the sake of showing how important validation is but he, just, I can't believe he did that. He switched off completely into this mode of, you have to do that. And what he wanted me to do was imagining a power animal sitting in that situation and being content with the situation. And I was like, is he really serious suggesting that while I'm sick to my stomach, I should imagine a power animal, which in my case would be a pouring cat, right? So I told him, no, I would imagine a hissing cat because this stench actually triggered my fight flight. So... Of course, I will not do that. And I never went to him again. Because I felt this guy just didn't get it at all. He wasn't helpful. So, you see, just because you are supposed to 
work with this special method of cognitive behavioral therapy, you are gaslighting yourself. You are not validating your own experience, being sick to the stomach and wanting to get outside and feeling stressed. You gaslight yourself by trying to impose some fake imagery onto yourself. And this is so wrong. It's not right. Just pointing this out, how quickly invalidation, devaluation and gaslighting can happen through a trained professional who does not validate the autistic experience.